Hello and welcome to this week's The Courageous Leaders Club. I am delighted to be joined here by CEO of Hey Human and Hey Lab, Neil Davison. Thank you so much for joining us today, Neil. Pleasure. Should be fun. Should be, I hope so, with all the whiskey behind it. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I reach backwards, you'll know why. <laughs> you need it. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate your time and I, I love the journey. You know, you started Hey Human in 2014. You've been, you know, really pushing the benchmarks with neuroscience, bringing that into your organization and winning awards as well, which is just fantastic. Um, this show, we do this show because we really want to inspire leaders to step into their courageous zone. You know, we've been through a hell of an 18 months. I think courage, yeah. bravery is needed more than ever right now. And I always start, my first question is always, what does being a courageous leader mean to you? Right. I mean, that that almost feels like one of those uh, essay questions where you, mm -hmm. you know, you pull to piece uh, the different parts of it. And I say that, Joe, because I think, I think there's the courage bit, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I think is worth reflecting on. But I particularly think, I don't think any of us think about what is leadership actually mean um so let me start with the courage bit go back a long time to when i, when I was uh, younger I, i i grew up in uh, aberdeen mm -hmm. and uh my dad worked on the oil rigs um mm -hmm. so he was an engineer and you know oil rigs very dangerous places and yeah the the uk model versus the norwegian model is you live and work on top of what is essentially you know dynamite uh which is slightly crazy plus the health and safety record of helicopters and all that was pretty dreadful um so i kind of think in a work context for me that you know when we talk about courage i kind of go that's courage in a work context yeah. you know bad things happen in all rigs um i don't know you know the story of piper alpha we we, we lost people because of that and that's like courage and right. you know That for me is like your benchmark, uh, you know. So uh, my point really is when I talk about courage and taking risks and being brave, we love to talk about being brave in our industry. I go, brutally, nobody dies, you know, and we, we can have a lot of fun. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think courage, you know, going back to where I started, you know, and that in, in, in that sense, there was real leadership where you worked in an oil rig and there was a load of blokes, you know, and you were literally protecting each other's lives and you, do you know what I mean yeah. um and I go you know that is like a real benchmark for me like I said and you know so courage is really pushing yourself mm -hmm. pushing others into a place that's better for both of us yeah. you know because I think the danger is like you can talk about courage and all that and it gets quite machismo or whatever there's a danger of that mm -hmm. Whereas it's, you know, yeah, another uh, sort of management term, but it is really about growing yeah. uh, and, you, you know, you growing. Yeah. And then I go leadership, second part, part of the exam question. <laughs> I, you know, I think, you know, like I said, I don't think people think about leadership enough. And, um, you know, you are uh, unfortunate to deal with something, somebody coming out of an MBA where I spent two years thinking about that. But I think there's, there's lots of myths about leadership. And there's lots of different models that I think people unconsciously or consciously adopt. So you go back probably to the 80s and like Jack Welsh and General Electric, and it was very much like, you know, have a strategy, stick to it. You know, people, you know, get out of the way, get rid of your worst 20% every year, all that stuff. And people, uh, you know, sucked it up. I think, you know, it's total rubbish. And then you've got charismatic leadership like your Richard Branson's etc that then veers a bit into all the stuff about brew dog and actually you know I always worried about their charismatic leadership because I know what blokes from the northeast of Scotland this is turning into the theme are like you know what I mean so all this kind of we're going to conquer the world etc yeah. seems really attractive but I don't you know yet again I don't think it's a very nice place for people to work in And then you've got your sort of Patagonia where it's leadership driven yeah. by purpose. Yeah. And I have to uh, then rise to the cliche and say there's the kind of leading from the front, but actually caring about people. And I'll just finish off that cliche by picking Alex Ferguson. Uh, <laughs> and 
Well, because I think people go, oh, you know, classic Scottish hard man, etc. But actually, his thing was, you know, he always looked, you know, where in the next three to five years? He all, you know, when they won something, he was always like, right, what is that still the right people and the right approach for three years' time? And he, you know, he could get incredible things out of humdrum footballers. You know, everybody goes on about Man United, but I grew up in Aberdeen with a bunch of average footballers who then won in Europe. And it, you could say it was all down to Alex Ferguson. And, and actually that he genuinely cared about people. You know, he is the only person I know who, who would literally uh, know the name of the woman in the canteen. You know, and you know, like Man United, hundreds of people, etc. He knew everybody's names, and his yeah. biggest question was always, "Where do you come from? You know, what are your roots? What matters to you? You know, and how does that affect you when you go in the field?" But then, final bit, I think you know, you'd even question whether he could work as a leader in today's football environment because that's seen as quite old school. So, I mean, it's for me. The courageous bit is helping people and yourself to go to better and maybe riskier places, but it's not that risky. Uh, and the leadership thing is, you know, there are lots of models uh, and you need to find the right model for you and the people that work with you. Yeah, I absolutely love that answer. Thank you. And <laughs> the bit I've just taken from listening to that is ultimately, at the, if you kind of go all these leadership models and there's lots, um, but at the actual core of each of these models really is caring about your people. Yeah. All people really want is to know they matter and ultimately to be heard and have a voice. And if you want to hear from what you're saying with Alex Ferguson, I've actually got his book. I haven't read it yet. So you've now inspired me to pick it off my shelf. Um, is that the fundamental basis, if you care about your people and it's a genuine care about your people mm. and they, they matter, that's really at the core and heart of leadership. Yeah. And, and, you know, yet again, some people know this analogy, but um, there was a, there's a photo, a famous photo of 11 men sitting on a girder in New York, eating their lunch, uh, you know, like 300 feet high, no ropes, uh, you know, it's black and white, 1920s. Yeah, sure. And apparently he had that in his office. And the gift for him was when MD ever came in, he'd go, do you see what those 11 men did? You know, and 11, 11 men, a football team, easy analogy, you know, they risk their lives for each other. What are you going to do? It's quite a hard one to push back against, if you know. Yeah, I mean. you kind of you kind of got it. And in terms of then how you apply this in your own leadership, have you then found a, a framework and a model that then you use, or have you kind of navigated a few and just found your own way? Yeah, I short answer is yes, but I think it's that that old kind of thing of I uh, you know when I think back to ad agencies previously. Mm -hmm. We were all, and I was as guilty as everybody, of, you know, let's say unconscious incompetence. Uh, yeah. You know, there wasn't a lot of training. There yeah. was, a, you know, you've done really well on this account, now have a load of people. Um, and then, so for me, that was just like learning from your bosses. No different to everybody else. And I think I was lucky enough to have some terrible bosses. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I literally, pre this interview, I thought, oh, God, I've probably had about a dozen bosses yeah. and two were really good. Uh, and I learned a lot from them, but I had learned a hell of a lot from the other 10 as well, if you know what I mean, like how that made me feel. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I spent a lot of time as I kind of went uh, up the uh, slidey pole thinking about, you know, what was useful, et cetera, in terms of managing people, managing change, et cetera. And then, you know, I've kind of kept that going in terms of doing an MBA. But even, you know, things like change management, you know, stuff like I learned about, you know, Cotter's version of change management. Now you look back on it and go, it's a bit linear. It was a bit obvious. You let, you, you know, you. so the answer for me is you take what you can from different bits and then you stick it to yourself and yeah. your situation. And you apply it. So what I'd love to then know is going back to then 2014, where you have to. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Um, taking on Hey Human, we, you know, we had a quick chat behind the scenes of, you know, that decision or how that came about for you and the bit of the journey you needed to go on to get Hey Human to where it is today. 
Um, I'd love to, if you'd happy to share some of that story of how you went through that, the changes and approached it and your thinking with doing that. Yeah, um, you know, oh God, when I go back to 2014, there's a very long story behind it of a very successful and focused business that made a lot of money that was bought by a private equity company that made a bad decision. They didn't know the sector. Uh, they looked at the numbers and, you know, didn't really get it right. And I th they would say that. Somehow, um, when they decided uh, to withdraw, because, you know, private equity's got timelines and all that kind of stuff, uh, I and some others ended up with the opportunity to take part of that agency group and then relaunch it as Hey Human. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I was kind of like, this may be the worst decision I have ever made, uh, yeah. but I kind of... I kind of went, what's the worst that can happen? Uh, yeah. And give it a go. And, you know, I turned down similar opportunities before, but I, th I thought at worst, I will learn a hell of a lot. You know, mm. you, you know, cliche and all that. But if it fails, I will yeah. come up wiser. Um, yeah. So, good. yeah, I mean, and, and then I, I said it to you before, but, I, you yeah. know, if I'm being really brutal, we looked at what we had, and if you think about culture, values, specialisms, skills, capabilities, even where we were located, I don't know what's left. Uh, I didn't. I didn't agree with any of it. And I, to your question, my thing was, where did I think agencies were going to end up in three to five years, yeah. and how did that fit um, with? what business we inherited um and deciding that you know it would be a long slow painful death being really open um but it was doomed uh so then going right what does the agency of the future potentially look like and let's chase that and mm -hmm. worry less about the bad stuff and get over there but have a pragmatic vision yes and how important do you think that vision is to be able to the people that went on this journey with you, the team that were there, for them to have that vision to be willing to change and realizing it, it, the company needed to involve. Uh, massive, um, but I think it was quite important for me as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the big thing is on on the you know vision and mission statements and all those kind of thing is you know I think it's a bit like workshops. We've yeah. all given time to those three things that we'll never get back and weren't particularly productive. I think, you know, a, a vision has to be, you know, guess what, visionary, yeah. but it also needs to be believable because, you know, you've had it, I'm sure. I've definitely had it. Everybody, you know, who's your peer or has, has joined the journeys had it. People yeah. have seen more visions and change initiatives fail than they've seen succeed so yeah. why they, should they believe me um yeah. so i kind of that's why i keep on saying yes vision but pragmatic vision this is how we think we're going to get there and you know in brackets it's not a quick journey yeah because how long was that journey for you to really start to see that change you were like this might actually work yeah how long was it i i, I think honestly mm -hmm. about two years okay. uh but because you know we were essentially there was nothing that didn't change i mean there was literally nothing you know because uh, i think every cynical you change the name of an agency and i remember you know getting coverage and the press going hey who you know, uh, and, I, and I felt a bit like at the start, you know, I don't know if you remember Scooby-Doo, yeah. when the villain takes the mask off <laughs> and goes, ah, you're really X agency with a bit of rebranding, you know, <laughs> uh, and but we stopped getting those kind of Scooby-Doo moments after about yeah. two years because people are just cynical, you know, when we'd actually done things that cost us money, cost us time, when we were doing things that other people talked about. Yeah. I mean, I find it, then it made a difference, but I find it incredible that when you interview people and they interview you, I still get it that people are trying to find out whether what you say mm -hmm. to the world outside is actually true. Yeah. 
you know, because I think people have been burnt. So actually just walking the talk was the big yeah. thing. And that took about two years to make stick. And that's great. And I'm just really pleased that we've got that message out today because and I think you've had it as well. You know, I do a lot of the work we're talking about helping companies going through trans uh, transformation. And it is, oh, Joe, we'd, we'd like it done in six months. And you're just like, ah, Ain't okay. Happening. It's not happening. And, and, you know, and you're trying to fit it into a financial quarter or a, a reason. It's like we're talking about human beings. You know, you're talking about humans changing. Uh, and it sounds like you had, they were stuck in one way of working and you were trying to literally turn it on its head to be a completely different way of working. And having, so for me, two years, I think is a really fair amount of time to expect that change to be embedded and normal and, and the new way you're going forward. Yeah. What would be some of the key learnings you, you, to the people listening that you would share that to help a culture change? What do you think are the key things now looking back that were fundamental to make that work? Yeah, I, it's, I think, you know, people might expect me to say this, but I can't underestimate it. And I've, you know, been on the, the, the kind of both sides of change quite a lot of times, but never to this degree, um, is do not underestimate, and it goes back to the neuroscience thing, do not underestimate the low level that we all have to take on board a message, make it stick and act on it. You know, it's I'm always saying, you know, repetition. You know, you you as a leader almost need to be bored of um, and embarrassed yeah. about what you're saying again and again and again uh, yeah. before you can think. Actually, it's starting to stick with people because you know yeah. they're all we're all busy. We've all yeah. you know we've all got lots of stuff going on, and it's my message, not theirs. Yeah. So what? You know what I mean? And 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 you know. There is, you know, yet another kind of thing that a lot of people say, but it needs to be said is, you know, it's not what you say, it's what you do. Yeah. You know, and you can undo a lot of saying in five minutes by doing something, you know, uh, that isn't on message, which, you know, is, is yeah, again, easy to say. But I think also when you're stressed yeah. and when you are maybe looking at numbers that are pretty horrific uh, early days, it's quite hard you know, to kind of have a game face. And there is that kind of whole debate about, you know, being open and transparent, et cetera. But there is a bit of, you know, how much of a favor are you doing people with, if you like, completely open? Because they're like, oh, it's not, I don't need to worry about that. That's your problem. So there's a, it's quite a, a, a challenge and balance, I think, is what we all need to do. And it's that fine line of appropriateness with openness. And then also when I work with a lot of leaders, it's like you've got to really think about how you're going to respond to this versus how you immediately feel you're going to react to it. It's just yeah. second in your brain to just go, hang on, I am in a leadership role here. You know, what's what's my role in terms of response? Yeah, totally. And I think that is, um, you know, sometimes you learn things from mm -hmm. academic work and sometimes you learn good things from lecturers. And, and I, I will credit one of my lecturers, my MBA, with... The thing that she and she, uh, you know, very accomplished, very smart academically. But the thing that always stuck with me that she always went on and on and on about is pausing yeah. and go, you know, and it just seems like an easy thing to say. But it was really pausing to think how much of this reaction yeah. is about me, yeah. how much is about the situation and yeah. how much about it is, you know, me and my, and my situation, but also just my, my kind of personality you know yeah. and if so for instance if your personality and also the myths and models about leadership is is yeah. you know jump in uh solve it move on sometimes yeah. that's right but my, i think my, one of my big things you know in terms of helping other people uh and i hope they get it i have to start repeating it more but is you know asking the question what is the right pace for this yeah. moment and is quick really the right thing and sometimes is slow the right thing? Are we going right? Well, we'll, we'll worry about this next week. And it's like, well, hang on. No, this kind of feels yeah. like it needs to be dealt with quicker than you think. Yeah. Or the other way around, you know, it's very easy. Let's just you know, give it the overnight test. Yeah. G give it some space to breathe. I think. Yeah. Many an unsent. And I've got a folder with overnight test emails, you know, that never get, <laughs> never get sent. Few. 
I love it. And he's also, I, I do a lot of Edith's work and it's that individual. And I think that's what's interesting that you're in that neuroscience space as well, is that you've got some people who need to be given the overnight to think about some people. And some people can actually find a solution very quickly. There's no difference in intelligence level. It's just yeah. the process information. Yeah, and, totally. Totally. And I, I like responding quickly, yeah. but I stop myself. Yeah. You know, and we've got other people uh, who like to read stuff and then get back to us. And, and actually, that's a massive strength because yeah. that's doing something that other people on the team might not be doing. Yeah. And just to go back to one of the points you said, you know, am I making this about me? I'm noticing a lot at the moment with the emerging leaders coming through that kind of manager level. They, they very much are making everything about them. And it's how mm. they do that transition into leadership where, oh, my God, it's not about me. Really, it's not about me <laughs> anymore. And it's really hard. You know, I, I always say I think I was probably quite a crap leader at that stage uh, because, you know, you're not given any training. Yep. Uh, you've just been promoted. Yep. Uh, you know, people are telling you you're great. Yep. Uh, guess what? It's now like, ooh. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's it's a pretty heady mixture. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, you know, constant theme with me, I don't think you've got a lot of knowledge yeah. about leadership. You yeah. know, you've got, you know, humans. yeah, 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 totally, yeah. totally. So I remember when, yeah, I, I was so ambitious getting all my, um, got my positions and then saying, oh, and here's your team of five people. And I was like, holy shit, I'm responsible for these five people now. I'd only been worried about myself getting to this title. And yeah, that moment when you realize you're responsible for other people's careers and futures. Yeah, it, and without any training, it is a lot to expect from someone. Yeah, yeah I remember, I th I'm sure with the best intentions, but yeah. Omnicom used to do this, like, you know, you know how many MBAs are the Vogue now, yeah. but you know, which is, is great. But they used to do an MBA where they sent their future leaders off for a week every sort of three months, which is fantastically expensive and, you know, and messed up the ages. So it was people from all different uh, Omnicom agencies. And then they stopped it because they did the right thing, which was make people reflect on who they are as a person and what yeah. they want out of life and then apply it to leadership. I think yeah. the unfortunate thing is everybody then resigned because oh. they were, oh, well, I've spent my time reflecting on me. And it's like, why would I work for Omnicom? See you. <laughs> Uh, just that, yeah, my... nothing against Omnicom, but you know, but you know that is that is the thing is like you need to give people that, but do it in the right way. Time to sort of reflect on them. And, and if that. you're a, yeah, yeah, and if you're going up like that, and you haven't had like a, a you know, a term that other people use, but if you haven't had a squiggly career, what what else are you bringing to it? Yeah, exactly, completely. And you've mentioned the MBA a few times now, which I love, and something it's crossed my mind, but it does seem quite daunting to do. How has that impacted you? How how has that now shifted your thinking in terms of now where you're going with the learnings that you've got from that? Yeah, I mean, it's ongoing. But I, I mean, I think the first answer is for me, um, when everything hit, I suppose it would have been March last year, I kind of just felt ready for it, which sounds, sounds a bit arrogant, I guess. But I kind of been, you know, learning about change management for, mm -hmm. you know, most of my career, but also I'd been sort of a focused on that and other bits of leaderships and organizations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and why I felt ready was I had a toolbox, you know, mm -hmm. that I didn't have before, you mm -hmm. know, and, and that it's weird people, you know, I, I've done an MBA and I've done an MA in creative writing. I'm more an MA in creative writing kind of person when I'm really honest, but I kind of push myself to do the MBA and people can be quite sniffy i don't know a bit weird about mbas because it's got this kind of certain image of you know people who are then be going to become venture capitalists and rule the world and all that kind of stuff <laughs> but actually i just kind of uh when everything hit i thought well in a funny way it's never been a better time i had about two subjects still to go on my mba mm. what have i learned in the last year and a half that's relevant to now, you know, say, yeah. you know, change my, there's a, it's yet again, a bit of a cliche quote, but you know, somebody uh, smarter than me said, you know, there's an argument to say old management is change management yeah. because you're always changing you projects, people, you know, yeah. little degrees are big degrees. So when, when all that change came, um, I just, it was just, you know, and things that we've looked at like together, but you know, things like our process structure, 
where we're going, how how we're going to manage, you know, even like how we're going to manage this kind of uh, car crash in terms of GI kind of slowing down while clients got their heads together, etc. I just kind of felt like, well, if I don't know how to do it now, I'll, I'll never will, frankly. Yeah, and just do that. And with with the you know, you're being the CEO of Hey Human, and your team seeing your passion for learning and education. Does that filter down then into the company, kind of the continuous learning appetite for, within Hey Human? Um, I hope. Why well, am I pausing? Because I because I go. I hope it does. But also, yeah. I'm kind of really conscious that people need, you know, and I'm talking about education in the broadest sense rather than just a bit of, you know, training on something new, uh, software or or something, you know, craft skill. But I think you, you need to want more education. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can't, you know, you like you can't motivate somebody if they're not motivated. You can help yeah. them get around the, the issue. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I hope that other people are going to want to do it uh, mm. down the line, etc. And I would, and you know, what I'm trying to do is share my learning. But yeah. by the same token, I also remember there is a bit of, you know, whenever you've been in a training course, like um, the Omnicom mm. one, it's like hold back a bit. It's like don't yeah. be the keen bean and ram it down everybody's throat. Kind of yeah. choose, choose your moment. But it, like I say, I think the thing about education, and everybody knows, you know, squiggly career yet again and all that, we're all going to need to continuously educate to respond to the world outside. Uh, yeah. You know, if I can do it in, in my 50s, you know, uh, and I've done it already once. I mean, all it meant was going to prep most of the weekend. It's, yeah. You know, there are worse things. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's so true because if you, um, you look at some of the future of work statistics at the moment, um, there's like 140 CEOs saying one of the, you know, things we've got to be so careful of now is upskilling and reskilling people. Because there's there's this stat at the moment saying that in 20, 2030, 80% of the jobs don't even exist yet. Mm. So the need to have a attitude in the companies of learning, reskilling, upskilling from for all levels. Um, to have to embrace that, to kind of go, we're changing faster than we've ever seen before. And it's only going to keep going. Yeah, and it's a bit like yeah. reacting to the uh, COVID crisis. We'd done a lot of stuff that was in place in terms of technology for remote working and things like that, that meant we were ready for it rather than panicking. And so with the education and upskilling thing, I think you're totally right, Joe. I think it's a thing of, you know, get ready now. Yeah. It's an attitudinal thing. Yeah. It's also understanding how to react to change. And, and yet yeah, again, I thank so many agencies and organizations so for handling chains so phenomenally badly that i was determined yeah. to try and do it a bit better you know yeah that's brilliant um and because i could sit here talking to you all day neil it's absolutely fantastic but i am conscious of the time and i do always like to finish with you know you, you've had so much experience and learning and I, I love the fact how you've shared a lot of your learning has come from kind of mistakes or bad bosses or bad experience and actually that's where sometimes the growth and the gold really is what advice would you would like you know give to your younger self or any kind of people now coming into this industry what advice would you like to give people that you feel like with your wisdom now you could pass on yeah um it's become a bit of a cliche the last 80 months but i always say you know never waste a crisis i've said yeah. that for a very long time now people are getting really bored of it it's like you can't keep on saying that for 80 months but you know <laughs> I, and I've always said it, like I say, yeah. it's like it's an opportunity to take a step back, yeah. you know, and go, what's going on here? And yeah. have honest conversations and change things. Um, so for me, that, uh, and I never thought I'd say this because it's a bit tree huggy for me, Joe, but I think it's like know yourself and be yourself. You know, I think everybody, everybody, I don't think you, I mean, it's got to be personal to me. I don't think you know yourself in your 20s. No. Um, I probably knew myself, but wasn't sure about myself in my 30s. Um, yeah. But, you know, and you, you kind of go, you, you know, things that I thought of pushed back and, and didn't tap into as a person. And now I go, actually, that's okay. Uh, why was I concerned about that? Or that's not okay. Um, if you're a six foot two Scott, you know, turn the volume down a bit sometimes when you think you're giving somebody a briefing they think you're giving them uh, um another b word but uh do you know what i mean so it's just like 
it is a cliche self-awareness but i do think you know and that all that knowledge bit helps you know yourself yeah. better would be and my I, piece i think that's so wise because right now for me that's what most of where most of my conversations are going is people going they're doing this reflection over this past time and it's like do you know what i need to get to know myself better i want to be me i'm sick well, like, i don't know if you've noticed a lot of the imposter syndrome is being talked about everywhere at the moment mm. People are sick of feeling like an imposter and they just want to be comfortable in their own skin and being themselves and being accepted for who they are. Yeah. And yeah. and I've seen that evolving people and then leaders giving that space to treat people like individuals so they can show up as who they are and be themselves. So thank you because I think that's a message that's so important right now. So so important. Is there any final parting words before we close today? I just say to everybody, it's easy to say, but have fun. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like going back to, you know, where I started. We're only doing advertising and marketing. We're not, you know, we're not drilling in the North Sea. So yeah. if we can't have a laugh, there's no there's no hope for anybody. <laughs> and I remember that's why I even got into advertising in the first place, because it just looks so much fun. <laughs> so yeah, to keep that it was going. in the it was in the early nineties, Joe, trust me. But that's a that's a different <laughs> episode. <laughs> And maybe what I'd love to get you back because I know there's so you've got so much to share, and I want to thank you so much. Enjoy. Pleasure. Keep, you're gonna have to get some more shells for your whiskey. Um, no, it has to stop there, Joe. As, <laughs> as I said to you, I started with two bottles at the start of the pandemic. It's getting out of hand. I love it. Enjoy it, and thank you so much. And for those that are watching with us live, thank you for being with us, and we will see you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Joe.